Looks like people are still falling in. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining from. In case you don't have it handy, I just dropped a link to the agenda notes in the chat. We'll give it just another minute, see if anyone else is joining before we get started. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Go ahead. Um, I have tried the link uh, for the QR calendar that we have in our community repo and it's empty. Is it me doing something wrong? Have we changed something? Okay, you have it. It appears to be working. For me. I was using the link. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was using a link in the from GitHub here. Maybe we change it. Yeah, maybe we need to update the, the link in the GitHub repository. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Interesting. It looks like a different calendar for some reason. Might be that we didn't change when we moved to uh, CNCF. Maybe. I'll look, I'll look into this. Thank you. Thanks. All right, then. Well, we are definitely at time to start. So uh, my name is Kat Morgan. This is the Cooper Community Meeting. And let's see, the agenda notes should be shared on screen. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Good deal. All right, then. Um, while we're here, if everyone can please take a moment to pull up the agenda notes and log attendance, that would be greatly appreciated. Of course, if we have any new uh, members joining today and you would like to introduce yourself, say hello. Um, love to welcome you here, what you're using Kubert for and what brought you in today. All right then, no new introductions. So jumping into agenda notes, um, please be sure and add anything that you would like us to cover today uh, to agenda, open floor, or um, <laughs> if you have specific <clears throat> bug, uh, bugs, bugs you want us to look at or PRs or anything like that, we can go ahead and cover those in their respective sections too. Call out anything that you're interested in us paying special attention to, and we will get to that in a bit. All right then, jumping into agenda. So Miguel, do you wanna go ahead and start with your interface hot plug? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so let me give you like a little bit of context. This is a feature I've been working on and off for the past year or something. Uh, it was originally stuck on on 
on Multis, basically we, we want to add like interfaces in runtime to running virtual machines. But since the virtual machines run in side pods, we need first to add interfaces to the pods. And that was something that took quite a lot of time to get like the momentum running in, in Multis. We eventually did it. And um, now we can unlock the, the part of Qvert. Uh, the thing is, there was an approved uh, design document, like, I don't know, some 12, 15 months ago. It's linked there. That's, it was the one below that one, actually. Yes, that one, original design document. And uh, yeah, so the, this proposal describes both the part in Maltus and the part in Qvert, what needs to be done, uh, like, not in too much detail, but it gives like a broader look into into it. If you could like just sc scroll down to the bottom of it, please. I think I can uh, elaborate a little bit up. Uh, there, 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 there. Like the API part of the VMIs, a little bit further down. That's it, like the thing with the phases. So this is something like the current, exactly that, thank you. Uh, the current uh, implementation that I'm providing in an open PR, I forgot to link it. I'll add it in a, in a while. It uh, basically mimics what we're already doing for the disk hot plug part. So it mostly has like a, all the components of uh, a QVert, like vert controller, uh, vert handler and launcher, they work they try to figure out like that the desired state what we have in the um, in the networks dot spec sorry in the spec dot networks is different than what we have in the in the current state like in the vm in the vmi status so the virtual controller notices this difference and uh it starts to do things and as like different components try to reconcile the states we create this thing, this interface hot plug status, and this has a phase and has more components like do what they're doing, like because we need to first hot plug into the pod, then the vert handler needs to to create the an, a bridge inside of the pod, a tap device, configure the tap device. Like as those things uh, happen, like each of these components would update the state of the um, of the VMI. And uh, this is kind of like a state machine kind of thing. And this is something that, well, I guess we shouldn't be doing any of this. We should just like have everything as stateless as possible and let just each component reconcile on its own the, the state. So basically what I mean here is that if the virtual controller sees <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so if you could just mute, please. If um, the idea here, instead of uh, maintaining this uh, the state machine that I, it's more error prone would be to have like an approach where if the controller sees that there's a difference between the desired state and the current state, it would just like uh, get Maltus to hot plug into the pod. And it will continue to do that until the state is exactly what it expects. It expects. Like the, the handler would afterwards just do the same thing. It would try to reconcile the state. And if it doesn't see the state that it expects, it would try to create the bridge and try to create the tap. Like if everything is item potent, it'll just like do nothing. It will not fail. It will just like uh, assuming the bridge was already created, it'll try again and the bridge is already there. So it'll do nothing and keep on being happy until like the launcher, like the launcher pod actually manages to uh, add the running, um, add the, the new interface into the running pod. When that happens, like we'll have the new interface in the, in the current state and nothing else will need to reconcile like everything is as they the the everything is as it is meant to be so i guess what i'm trying to get at is that i really want to get rid of all these phases that they basically smell of a state machine and have everything stateless 
at the cost possibly of a little less visibility on the VMI status of uh, what is happening while the reconciles are happening. And uh, I know I spoke a lot and I uh, probably just was a convoluted explanation and uh, I, I would welcome any feedback and um, any questions you have about this as well. Or Miguel, can I ask you uh, how you're going to add the top interfaces without the state? Uh, not sure how it can be handled for the virtual machine. For now, we're running the binary with uh, adding the interface inside the pod for the virtual machine. Do we? Uh, so, so what is exactly the question? Could you rephrase it a little bit? Like, which components are you worried about? Uh, we have device? a multus. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how Multus is working for device hot plugging. I haven't checked okay. it yet, but uh, I guess that at some point we're having the interface inside the pod, how we can yes. uh, add it to the virtual machine and exactly. what exactly so, we want to reconcile there. So, okay, uh, this thing will start like, um, there will be like a difference, like you issue mm -hmm. a command, like a vert cuddle command, exactly like uh, it is done for the disk hot plug and the vert cuddle will issue a command to the API and it will change, it will update, it will mutate the, the VMI spec and it will add like uh, an entry to the networks and an entry to the interfaces, okay? Yeah, I got it. Then you'll have three components like the vert controller is the first one and it'll see that uh, like, they will all see that the there's a difference in between the expected state and the current state. <laughs> and they will each try to do their thing. So first the vert controller will see, okay, I need to ask Maltus to put me another interface into the pod. Uh, I will afterwards like um, send you more information about how we got models to do this so you can check it afterwards, but let's just focus on Qvert for now. So the vert controller mm -hmm. will ask Maltus to add the new interface, right? Maltus will try to add the interface and it has a reconcile loop as well. So it'll eventually have the interface available in the pod. The vert handler will try to create the in-pod bridge and uh, the tap device and connect the pod interface to the in-pod bridge. If the, until the pod interface is there, it will fail, but it's, it's a reconciled loop. It will try to keep on, it will keep doing, try to do the same thing until it manages to. So when the pod interface becomes available in the pods, this next, this next step, like the step that vert handler does will succeed. Like you'll, you'll have a pod interface, you'll have the pod interface connected to a newly created in pod bridge for this new interface and you'll have a newly created and configured tap device. The vert launcher, mm -hmm. which yeah. would be the final component, it would do, do the same thing. It will initially fail because it doesn't have the tap device. It will reconcile until it finds the tap device. Once the tap device is there, it will just do uh, the PR that I will link afterwards also already has that call. It's something like a touch device or something. You just give it like uh, the snippet of XML and it'll just plug it into the, the running virtual machine. And once that is in the virtual machine, it is reported by the domain and it will be listed in the vmi.status.interfaces. Once that happens, Everything will stop reconciling because the desired state and the uh, current state uh, now matches. Very clear. Thank you. Uh, uh, welcome. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Miguel. So um, I think thanks a lot for bringing this topic up. I think the overall idea of um, uh, removing phase um, sounds very uh, like it sounds in line with the conventions that Kubernetes community is um, advocating. Um, I've pasted the source and um, uh, quote from there. Um, it, this used to be a, a good practice when Kubernetes started in the early versions, but we've, they've started moving out of phase into uh, conditions. Um, now, as far as I understand, um, 
all the state that you need in order for reconcile in reconciliations to be idempotent you have that in in the form of uh, pod interfaces and uh, uh, vmi interfaces the only question i think you have is that if we remove the face there will be some sort of loss of verbosity where users will not be clearly users will not clearly be able to understand what's going on behind the scenes is that exactly correct? exactly okay. that's a very good explanation of what happens so you would have absolutely no information of what's going on in the system until the interface is actually plugged and let's say that it fails for whatever reason like you will not know that it failed because i have no way to report that because everything is trying to reconcile um have you considered raising uh events warning events uh, for um failure cases so i think we, um I what know. what needs to happen is in a happy case when things work it it might be okay to not have that information since this is a transparent operation but in in a failure scenario it will be critical to understand what is failing um i would uh, suggest looking at raising events so and just to backtrack where this comes from so if you look at um mount mount errors in uh, pod right now if pvc is not able to mount on a pod um you don't see it in the pod api but you do see events being raised like mount attach error and things like that um, i see this very analogous to that and you could consider using events uh, uh, yeah case. that's that's very interesting like where my current implementation uses events but i think it actually does the opposite like it does it sends events when everything succeeds which is kind of uh well redundant because that will be noticed in the state of the vmi that's a really good point yeah you could keep the successful events because there yeah. there is precedent for that but i would highly encourage adding failure event so then we can document how to debug the failure scenarios in case of hot plug is not working okay thank you a lot for the for that feedback and uh yeah that was uh, like the, the initial part you said like uh to report stuff not via phases but using the conditions is something that yeah depending on the feedback i got today i that was the next thing i try i would try to do yeah um i so i'm not sure if if this hot plug will be rolled into one of the existing conditions or we will introduce new ones i i need to dig into it but certainly um adding events will give you visibility into what's happening with the reconciling yeah i think this is very useful i just remember how pvc's persistent volume claims are working and they always reporting good cases and error cases as well for example the volume was attached to a specific node you always see this uh, kind of events for the pvc's Well, thanks a lot for your feedback. Um, anyone else has more to add to this topic? Okay, if not, I think we can move on. Uh, yes. Thanks everyone for your for your for the info and the feedback you gave me. Thank you, Miguel. All right, and. Let's see, FOSTEM information. Always fun to keep up with the events. Let's see, what are the submission due dates? December 10th and January 10th for Brussels and Vancouver. Ooh, Vancouver. I might have to see about that. I wonder if I can pull that one off. Mm 
guys. Let's check out um, state of C group V2 support. You want to take that away? Uh, yep. I just wanted to ask. <laughs> I started, I tried to use Kubeirt on latest Ubuntu Jamie, uh, and I found that some features are not working. For example, attaching uh, hot plug devices, block devices, and non hot block, uh, hot plug block devices make them not working. And I found that there are some issues with the C groups version two, uh, mainly because of uh, the current solution does not allow you to see uh, the current rules for the devices. And I just wanted to ask if uh, anybody using it in production and what the current state of C groups version two, uh, do we supporting it uh, and Actually, the uh, question about the production and I just trying to understand if we want to support it or it's better to use version one for a while. So this is a first heard. That's a real surprise to me. Uh, we do aim to support C groups V2. Um, RHEL 9, which is out, uh, ships C groups V2 enabled by default. So. The fact that we're hearing issues with C groups at this point is kind of yikes. We 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 intended to be supporting it already. Are there bugs for this upstream? I see the GitHub issue here. Is that capture the sum total of what the, the problem is? Uh, just scroll down. There will be a link to the latest issue. Uh, VM can't restart after add volume. So the problem is that uh, there are some rules added by Kubernetes. For example, if you're using block devices, it's attaching the, uh, the rule for a low pod using this device. And when we running uh, our C group manager, it always overrides these rules. Okay. Thanks for the hey, Andre. Up. Andre, did you try to run it with uh, latest Kubernetes uh, as Vasily suggested? Uh, yes, I'm using latest version, a little bit patched, uh, but this case is not working there. I saw somebody started uh, working on that issue, exactly on this issue. Yeah, I think Vasily was looking at this and I was by chance also looking into what we can do uh, to improve the situation. Yeah, also just thinking uh, what kind of, what corner cases it can uh, lead to us. Uh, we can handle the devices because we know the pod spec um, and the virtual machine spec actually to see the block devices and add specific rules for that. But is there anything else which we can't control? because currently we can't find uh, what the current rules, the um, C groups attached to the pod C group. Yeah, so about that, um, I was thinking maybe we could, because a lot of Kubernetes deployments will be moving to uh, system D as a manager of C groups. I'm not mm -hmm. entirely sure, but maybe systemd will be keeping the list of devices that are allowed for a unit or for the for the pod or container. And I guess we, we need to check if that's the case. If, if that's the case, we can probably integrate with systemd and uh, take the devices from there. But it would be the only solution for systems that are using systemd. Yeah. I was also thinking about uh, downloading the eBPF program and decompile it, but it sounds some, some, somehow difficult. I'm not entirely sure there is API to um, actually load the, load the program back to you. Uh, I got something from Cilium uh, chats and they saw that there, they say that there is some options for that, but uh, I guess in output you'll get the 
low code and which is not easy to read or somehow yeah, parse. I see. Yes. Um, well, you no, I, I'm sure how how it will be returned, but if it's like the internal terms, you could you could decompile it like there is a jump for this minor version and so on. But okay. I, I guess we need to see if, if that's possible. Thank you. Then ERs mm -hmm. noted yet. We'll come back to that if we get through what we yeah. have on here. Mailing list review. Let's see what we got. Um, Anyone have opinions or first thoughts on? Um, hi, I was trying to dig into the change in behavior just to understand API compatibility across upgrades. And mm -hmm. I was not sure what change is being uh, suggested. So to recap what the email is basically saying is that the current behavior right now, if you have a data volume that's set to auto populate and you delete it, it's going to recreate a new one. And that behavior, bad or good, it might be surprising to some people if we reversed that behavior, which is why she's proposing this is a, a change. Uh, but the new behavior that she's suggesting is that the data volume would not be recreated if you then did a delete. And um, is the data volume of V1 API? That I don't know. Is anybody from the storage team here? I would suspect that it probably is. And so I I, I suspect what you're getting at, and I would definitely agree with the concern. It's yeah. one beta one, technically, still. Uh, yeah, makes sense. So I, I would um, recommend that we not break uh, API um, behaviors um, in for uh, reasons which are very well established. I think what I would suggest is add adding a spec field uh, which is backward compatible that uh, allows us to define a policy. Um, that policy will default to what it is default to the current behavior. So any upgrades will continue to work. Uh, and then users can choose to have a different uh, policy that uh, implements the new change in behavior and then backups um, or use cases on top of that new policy can continue to uh, work with a different spec value. I'm not sure if I was able to communicate the idea clearly, but I can respond to that uh, thread uh, with this thought. No, I, uh, what, what you're saying definitely makes sense. Um, but Shelly, the author of that email, isn't uh, in this meeting. If you can respond, that would um, be helpful. Yeah. And jumping into bug scrub. Sweet, that looks like that one's covered. Uh, hey, hey, uh, sorry for interrupting. Um, I, I failed, this is Fabian and I failed. Can you hear me actually? Yes, we can hear you. 
Oh, that's great. That's a good precondition. Um, um, I failed to add something to the minute doc because I failed to open it. Um, but I would like to quickly speak about um, um, the work that I'm currently doing. I sent an email a few weeks ago about reordering how we how we don't manage approvers, but how we give a growth path to approvers and how we spread the load more. And I just wanted to use that opportunity to speak about it, if, they, if that's fine. Go for it. Cool. Then let me open um, a new slide deck. Uh, which I was working on. Uh, do you want to share screen? No, I'll take yeah, yeah, I'm I'm working on it. Just a second. And I'll take all of this to um to the mailing list as well. But I thought I used the opportunity while everybody's here to ask uh, to answer questions if there are any. Share my screen. Um, this one. Share. A window. Just a second, I need to find it. There it is. Can you see a single window? Yes. Yes, we can see. Okay, I'm always scared to share more than what I intend to. Okay, so um, this is about uh, mainly the approvals of Kubert Kubert. And um, so today, um, let me just reorganize that. Okay, so today, approvals are here to help, I mean, approvals are generally here to help anybody, right, to get stuff into Kubert Kubert. And we have contributing guidelines of how you become a, an approver. And we have a few if you look at the owner's files. And um, uh, so that's good. Um, however, I think the second bullet illustrates a little bit the pro one of the problems that with, with the approvers. Approvers are focused or are asked to focus on a holistic, holistic acceptance of contributions, including backwards, forwards compatibility, adhering to API and flag conventions, subtle performance and correctness issues, interactions with other parts of the system, EDC, DC. So there are many requirements on the approvers that need to be met in order before you can become an approver. But by now, Kubert is so large. Uh, that it takes a while to, until you're or somebody is familiar with, with the whole code base and in order to meet these uh, requirements. So the basic idea is, can we can we break that apart and not say you need to be aware of everything, but that we define uh, that we define um, effectively the um, yeah. Oh, I should I should add a slide here. So the idea is to say we we split that whole burden of the approvers and create something like sub subsystem maintainers, like they're on the, uh, in the kernel or even Kubernetes, right? To create subsystem maintainers. And we have something like subsystem maintainers already today, which we have today, which are the ZIGs, right? But ZIGs, and by the way, I took the term ZIGs because we use them quite consistently in the, in the test cases that we have in Kubert and sometimes they're used across the code base. And so I try to classify or differentiate what is between six and what is between like approvers, what is the relationship? And it seems like six are mostly focused today about resources, right? I mean, that's not completely true, but they're like domain experts for, for the compute parts, right? For all the virtualization APIs, virtualization specifics, for the storage part. I mean, we just spoke about PVCs and the um, changes to CDI possibly and about networks. So we have teams which focus or people uh, who focus on these areas, but today each of these teams is actually maintaining their own knowledge for the Kubernetes problems, right? How do we write a great API? How do we uh, ensure that that scale will be carried forward, right? That we continue to scale. What considerations do we have to do for live migrations, for for backups, for updates, right? All of this is now built or maintained within these is these six more or less, and only aggregated or reviewed when an approver comes in. So one of the ideas is to say, let's let's actually try to define these areas that an approver is taking care of uh, with then the goal to say, now, if we have any skilled person who has already the skills or who is really motivated to build up these skills to be in one of these um, sub-approvers or subsystem maintainers, um, which um, is like that second group of bullets here, which I'm calling SMEs right now, but maybe actually subsystem maintenance is better. Um, 
Yeah, and it would start with defining these important areas, right, and introduce these super provers for these areas. Um, these super provers or subsystem maintainers, I would call them SMEs. And um, SMEs and ZIGs are required to cooperate voluntarily, right? So it's not mandatory, for example, that an SME is, is, uh, is approving the work that a ZIG did or the other way around. It's, it's required to be as friendly, right? And SMEs should be like the, the first gate before you get the final approval, right? And they are your subject matter experts if you need to, uh, or they are the go-to person if, person if you have a specific request about one of these important areas. And ideally, by the way, ZIG members, um, ZIG members, um, volunteer members, or are parts of these SME groups. Because how can we meaningful, well, what are meaningful areas, right? And the areas that, and I spoke to a couple of people, and um, like the list that it we, we came up with, and by the way, that's like the third or fourth iteration is um, API and controllers, right? They are um, related. Um, so API and controllers and the responsibility would be to, to ensure that consistent, well-written and future-proof APIs uh, are used, right? And they're like all the discriminator discussion in Kubernetes and how that maps down to us. That is something where I think somebody needs to have, should have, you know, an impression of how our API is built and designed in Kubernetes to ensure that we can then provide, you know, continue to have a consistent API across all parts of Kubert. Controller patterns, like shared informers, and I think there were some changes. I think Michael Hendrickson was looking into that. Uh, so I think controller patterns also, right? This is the roughly the area that somebody could concentrate on. Scheduling and node plumbing. So um, they also, also both relate, right? Because scheduling is so heavily built around labels and label selector mechanisms and node properties. That's why they were grouped together. Um, and node plumbing, because this effectively also includes CNI, CSI, and device plugins. Specifically, CSI and device plugins also denote um, node resources, right? And that is why we move them into one bucket, right? And by the way, within such a group, you can still have your expert for, for, for niche cases, right? Specifically for CNI or specifically for CNI, specifically for device plugins. But it would also work out sample cover because it's node plumbing, uh, SL Linux, SecComp, um, all these, anything that's happening and taking place on a node. Scale and observability. Uh, so Ryan was pretty active in the scale area. And what it actually saw is, by the way, that the scale work or to make sure that we can scale was uh, was um, accompanied by actually observability work, right? The metrics were introduced in order to be able to measure, do we actually scale? And that's why scale and observability um, relate to each other because observability is always needed in order to, to make sure, um, yeah, that we can measure what we believe we can. By the way, that reminds me that observability is also an important tool for operations, and operations is not represented here in these important areas. Then with the whole CI and testing framework uh, SME group, so we have awesome dedicated people who are maintaining our CI, let it be the lane of <laughs> Hubert CI. And by the way, so we have that whole maintain the infrastructure, right? Maintain the metals. We have maintained Kubert CI to, you know, which are the foundations for our lanes. People are doing it. And um, I think it would be nice to, formal, for example, formalize this group, which is doing this full time almost. Kubert CI and Prowl, for example, to me, that plays into the testing framework. So this SME group would be, you know, doing everything except for um, writing and fixing test cases, for example, or fixing bugs, which, which arise from test cases. Um, these are really specific to the group, which is writing them, right? Let it be the storage network or compute people or somebody else. Build system, because it seems like Basil is uh, is enough to keep us busy, uh, but it also includes, by the way, uh, all the vendoring updates that need to go through Basil, right? So if they're vendoring updates, then these need to be managed. They need to be pushed forward. Um, so that is why the build system SME group was uh, suggested as well. And in the end, I'm not sure, but VM lifecycle and live migration. So lifecycle is specifically to say through what stages does a VM actually run? Does it make sense? Right. How, for example, if we think about backup and restore, right? In what states do VMs need to be suspend, resume? We had them or pause VMs. Uh, so that's the life cycle. And then there's all, but to me, life cycle is pretty pretty vague. Um, I I still struggle a little bit to define it crisply. 
Live migration, it's like a broad topic. And why doesn't only fall on compute? That is because it's touching everything, right? How would we deal with storage during live migrations? How would networks, right? And Andre, I see your PR, by the way, about the unplug and replug of networks during live migration. I think that's a great idea. It would be interesting to see um, how that can be made. Uh, yeah, if it makes it way into Kubernetes uh, itself, by the way. So these are like important areas that got identified. And I'll be sharing that deck, I hope, later this week. Uh, to, I mean, I shared another deck, but that was even worse. So this, I hope, is better. I'll share it uh, towards the end of the week um, to get your input. And so my proposal will be to complete the ZIX and formally introduce them in our owner's files and to accompany it by SMEs or actually uh, alternatively is a subsystem maintainers, right? To pick up the kernel term, uh, subsystem maintainers. So I'll be going forward to, to see that we um, yeah, <coughs> to propose this change. Also, by the way, I think if you're a subsystem maintainer, there's less time and less expertise you need to invest in order to be such a maintainer. So I hope with, with such a change, we actually get more approvers, right? Or more people who feel uh, competent to, to approve PRs. Um, yeah, so that's work is going on simply to help us to scale, right? And to make sure that we don't drop the ball in area, any important area um, and to move forward. Uh, so that's a quick update from my side on this. I'm here to hear any feedback uh, right now, but also later on the mailing list. Hi. Um, Amal, I thank thanks a lot for the initiative. I think it it makes a lot of sense, and uh, I agree with the um, problem and the attempt at solving that problem. I have some questions. Um, so um, on the uh, important areas, um, I saw API uh, review and controllers. I think. Um, one of the things that we have been struggling with running uh, Qbert is um, um, upgrades and maintaining um, backward compatibility during upgrades. Uh, do you think um, upgrading and um, maintaining backward compatibility is rolled into that uh, API review and uh, controllers um, area or um, does that need a separate um, se um, section of its own? Um, first, thanks for that comment. That's great. So um, before I answer, let me ask, so what specific struggles did you have um, during upgrades? Was it like, were it API things or did you have other? Yeah, it, it, was, it was API things. So one of the issue was that, um, default was changed to uh, a new API field was introduced. While that API field was itself backward compatible, the behavior defaulted to uh, mm. false instead of true. Uh, so the behavior was not a backward uh, compatible and mm. that led to uh, some failures. Um, and then there were other um, two other cases when we also um, saw failures. but. To be fair, we were upgrading from version 0 0.35 to 5.0. So there was a lot of lag um, and things changed. So, um, but regardless, that points to an important area that uh, I think we should all be um, focused towards that is making sure that upgrades are, um, upgrades are um, handled correctly and we have a very, um, defined a process for how many versions we stuck support uh, um, be behind the latest version, right? So Kubernetes has plus minus three. Um, and I think Ryan is doing some work um, in order to stabilizing the release. And these process changes can follow that release schedule. So anyway, that was a lot of talk, but just wanted to get your thoughts. Oh, yeah, but no worries about the the length uh, of your uh, of your contribution right now because I spoke for much longer. So um, I think backwards compatibility. So it's great. By the way, I think it's good if you if you encounter several things. I think it's good that you start finding bugs if you see or like backwards incompatible changes. File bugs about them because I'm not really sure that somebody was aware that we break backwards broke backwards compatibility. I know it like of two cases. 
For example, we dropped floppy support silently at some point in the past while it's still in the API, but it has no effect effectively. It's blocked, I think, with an emission controller for that. Um, and then I think in the bridge and binding and the network binding uh, modules, there were probably also some breakages simply because it was so messy to get that uh, somewhere decent. But yeah, I think backwards compatibility, that's something to consider here on the API level. Okay. On the other end, also, for example, on the live migration side um, and node plumbing as well, to a certain extent. So I see several areas, but API might actually be the most important one. So I added it here. Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. And um, I think in one of the previous community call, I raised this topic of um, enhancing uh, the API, well, adding some new things to the API review process. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to redo the whole thing, but I'm, it is on my to-do list to uh, summarize that conversation and putting put it on the mailing list. So um, I what was being proposed was in line with this proposal and um, API review could be like one of the first, um, you know, say that um, that takes this particular solution in uh, in mind and implements uh, things like checking for backward compatibility. So um, yeah, just a heads up, I'll, I'm planning on starting that conversation uh, soon. Yeah, and you're great. And by the way, I think there's an opportunity to do that in an automated fashion, right? Because I think um, getting the defaults from Qbert, uh, for, I'm not sure. No, we probably don't have everything in, in, in the open API. But I wonder if there's an opportunity for automation to actually do regression testing on yeah. change defaults. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had another question. So if um, the last uh, point says uh, VM lifecycle and uh, live migration, while live migration makes sense, do you think VM lifecycle is also somewhat largely related with API uh, and controllers? Uh, and if there is a significant overlap, um, is like is that something that should be mentioned there as well? You know what, I'm I'm with you because I mean VM lifecycle was a recent comment, and I appreciate that comment, but. To me, it's difficult to isolate it, to you know, to really scope it. I I have my challenges with it. You know what I will do? I'll go back to that person who suggested it and see how that person uh, was imagining uh, this this area. You know how 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 that person is imagining the frame of that area, and then I would get back here. I'll, I'll let me take a note actually because again, it's to me. Um, how how would this be scoped? I'm yeah. Myself. No, I, I think where, where you're going with this makes sense. I, the only reason why I bring it up is if there is an, so we're introducing a new process. If there is any kind of ambiguity, I uh, I am a little bit concerned about the implementation of that process. So at least from the uh, start, I'm trying to uh, make this as crisp as possible so that um, all the stakeholders are um, you know, uh, on the same page. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Yep. And in the, because you mentioned it, um, I put up a PR, um, this one, 8791, uh, which is actually about reworking the release MD file to, to reflect the new release uh, cadence uh, that we were discussing and um, finally, there were some rough agreements and that's why we put it up here for, for review. So um, feel free to, to chime in here as well. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I'll take a note of that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I'm done. Awesome. Thank you for the conversation on all of that. And it's definitely an important topic. So if anyone else has follow-up thoughts or ideas, feel free to put it on next week's agenda or bring them up in the mailing list. All right, let's see. Go ahead and knock out the last of the bug review if we can. image upload.
do we have a verbosity flag for the upload or which pod is responsible for i guess we'd have to look at the cdi pod logs that if you're sharing anything we don't see oh it. that's right i forgot i stopped sharing screen let's see thank you okay there we go um issue with uploading using the kubectl vert plugin um it looks like basically they're asking i had the same problem with cdi uh, when i was trying to upload a huge windows image yeah interesting i'm gonna have to do that later today actually um, i'll try to link it to the uh cdi issue but not sure if it will fix anything it is hanging there for a couple of time okay i am going to save this one to respond to and myself in a couple hours and let's see Windows oh, XP, that is so amazing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Nostalgia over here. Um, Daniel, you, you have a fan. <laughs> yeah, it looks like. So yeah, I guess um, I guess I can could probably assist here. Would you probably uh, CC this to me? Then I could take a look. Sure, thank you. Thank you. All right, and let's see. Adding static route operation not permitted. Um, this does not feel like an incredibly Kubert related issue. Oh. Is there any uh -huh, and sudo does not work as well. I don't remember if, uh, if you can, can you scroll down to the bottom, yeah. like uh, that network configuration and cloud in it uh, using network data. A uh, version one. Well, first of, I am. I don't currently remember if this, if uh, Zero OS actually understands any of that. Right. And if it does, I mean, this is currently being tested with Fedora. I'm quite oh. sure. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is a Zero OS issue or if it is like um, a NetPlan version one issue. I'm not sure. Is it container disks or? I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But... Okay. 
Um, nevertheless, I think we have an issue because I'm looking at the user guides and we actually use, like one of the examples features that, no, that no, features no, the no, qvert no, slash no, no. 0s container disk and cloud in it with network data. So either we have a bug in the code or in the documentation. Just link, I'll link here in the chat. Oh, I have a, or, sorry, go ahead. I have a slightly uh, different point to raise as well. So if you go back to the error message, um, it, it says um, uh, RT netlink error. Uh, I have um, seen those kinds of error when, uh, when there is some kind of um, security um, context permissions that are not allowed to execute those IP route commands. So could it be possible that um, the container is mounted with config in such a way that it's not, uh, it does not have enough permissions to carry out those network operations. And, and I think where I'm going with this is, this could be an underlying cluster issue and not a uh, a cube word uh, problem, right? Like the weird thing as it like is, if this is cloud in it, which it looks it is from the configuration that he's providing in the bottom, that happens inside of the guest. It's not like um, your pod configuration shouldn't uh, impact what's happening inside of the guest. Ah, I see. Isn't it a problem of zeros? That's, well, that's what we're guessing, but I don't know, could be. Um, I would ask if the problem can happen in other distributions. Yeah, that's where I was headed with the comment. Um, I'm not familiar enough with the Xeros image to even know if we have any privileges in that image for like to escalate. Um, I think I'm going to run with this one. Uh, just asking for them to try something else. And then as far as Hmm. I'll tell you what I will do. Do this. I will try to test the docs and then report if this doesn't pan out. So that should handle both of those needs. Hey, I forgot uh, to say you know, that image about the image uploading. I haven't read it fully. Uh, now I read and I see that this is different problem. Okay. So this is just about uh, missing error message that CDI is not installed. Got it. All right, then it looks like that covers bug scrub, mailing list review. And we have nothing called out on PRs. We are a minute over, so I will go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you all for your participation. And we'll see you same time, same place next week. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.